So continuing the trend of tracking smaller and smaller organisms, um, this study will focus on, a, to put it in perspective, about an 8-gram um, warbler, in, a North American warbler. Um, and for my talk, I'll be focusing in on sort of the role that ecological barriers play in shaping stopover behaviors uh, during migration, for in particular stopover departure decisions. Now, ecological barriers, um, loosely defined by Allerstam in 1990, are simple landscape level features that impede range expansion, or in our particular case, migratory movements. And although, I guess, from the talks that we've seen to add today, why would a smaller, I mean, you guys are used to sort of the Sahara as being a giant migratory barrier, the Gulf of Mexico. Um, but it's important to note that bodies of water, any type of barriers of any size, may play an important role in sort of attributing to behavioral reluctance to actually do a direct crossing of it. And in particular, in my study system in the Great Lakes, we'll be looking at Lake Erie as a potential migratory barrier. Um, so this begs the question, is really Lake Erie uh, a migratory ba barrier? Well, some preliminary evidence from uh, Deal et al. in 2003 using radar observations suggests that, you know, you've got a, sort of an accumulation of, song, of migrants along the coast. Um, and migrants that are caught over water typically return to the nearest coastline. So sort of pointing at, the uh, indicating essentially a reluctance to make a direct cross of this water body. Um, in particular, looking at the challenges associated with crossing of an ecological barrier, we hypothesized that given the risks associated with crossing this barrier, that it was expected that birds should adopt behaviors during stopover that would limit the risk and facilitate a safe route crossing. Um, in particular, within our study system of Lake Erie, we expected that on the south shore of Lake Erie, basically the staging grounds for a uh, migratory crossing, birds should have longer stopover durations, um, sort of in order to facilitate increasing fuel reserves. Basically, these birds are landing there, um, refueling as efficient, putting on as much mass as possible in order to safely cross the barrier. Um, further, we expected that birds, along those same lines, that birds should depart with higher fat scores. I Really, having enough fuel stores on your body in order to make the crossing is going to be a paramount. Um, and lastly, um, given what we've sort of learned over the past several talks, we'd expect that birds should be more selective of departure wind conditions, given its importance in sort of minimizing the energy required to cross. Um, further, we sort of want to look, given that these sort of relationships, we expect that these relationships should be mediated by constraints imposed by selection pressures, i.e., for species with longer migratory routes, such as you know, the American Red Star in North America, um, we expect that there should be greater selection pressures should be exhibited, um, all on the sort of notion of early arrival. This is an extremely time-minimized migrant. And we expect that their strategy should differ than a migratory songbird with a, with less time in his minimization. Um, in order to, sort of, to capture these movements, again, it's, a, it's an 8-gram bird. Um, it's an 8-gram and 15-gram bird, respectively. Um, we use a series of automated radio telemetry towers located um, all along the Ohio, Michigan, and Ontario coastline and up into Ontario in order to sort of track these movements. Um, in particular, for this study, we set up an array at Long Point Bird Observatory and Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge, Refuge respectively. This is the pre-crossing site and this is the post-crossing site. And we took a, a comparative approach in assessing how birds, how the responses of birds in, in accordance with fuel loads and wind conditions changed whether you found yourself po prior, to, prior to crossing a migratory ba barrier um, and post-crossing. Again, these radio towers briefly consist of several antennas mounted on a mass in an automated data logger that records timestamp the ID of an individual. Um, and with this information, we sort of can um, estimate a departure time, a departure orientation, and any subsequent landscape level movements picked up by regional towers located along the way. Um, a little, sort of a little bit more specifics about the system. At the stopover site, this is directly at Long Point or Ottawa. Um, we had at least three radio towers with about four plus antennas per tower. Um, 
And in total, this, about, this encompassed an approximate area of about 40 square kilometers. 40 to 60 square kilometers, but conservatively about 40. Um, in addition, we had several landscape level towers, and these were, these were located approximately 20 kilometers away from the study site. Um, and with this information, we we're sort of able to distinguish um, landscape level relocations from actual true migratory movements. Um, in addition to all the other information we gather in terms of movement along and around the Lake Erie coastline. Um, again, bringing it back to the species, uh, we wanted to look at the effect that essentially the selection pressures played on governing these relationships. So we used the American Red Star, uh, a model, speech, model basically long distance migrant um, in our system um, with extreme time minimization. Um, several studies pointing to sort of the need of early, the, the relationship of early arrival on the breeding grounds to um, higher reproductive success. Um, in comparison, or in contrast, we used also the yellow rumped warbler, a slightly larger migrant. It's about, um, put it in perspective, about 13 grams. Um, slightly heavier than the American Red Star. But it's an early season migrant, uh, early short distance migrant um, with, typically we consider them dawdlers. Um, they're not trying to make it as quickly as possible. Although more evidence is needed really to, on the, more evidence is needed on the relationship between early arrival and reproductive su success. Um, over the course of the season, this was in 2012, we collected, a proc uh, we collected 51 individuals um, spaced proportionately across both study sites and between both species. And in order to sort, we took a survival analysis approach to model the probability of departure given several, several variables. Um, and in, in particular, we used the Cox proportional hazards model, which is sort of a neat survival time analysis model as it's pretty much a ideal for studying the probability of departure in respect to stopover. Um, some of the advantages include the it accommodates sensor data. And in our study, unknown arrival time is actually very important. Is one of the assumptions we sort of have to deal with um, and can be quite a nuisance. Um, in addition, it allows um, the extended version of this model allows for the inclusion of time-dependent variables. Um, these are wi wind weather variables often. And given its regression-like implementation, it's fairly easy to interpret. And actually, the message can get conveyed quite quickly. Now, jumping right into the results, um, what we found, as expected, we found that, on average, fat birds were approximately 7.5 times more likely to bar depart on a given day than lean birds. And again, fat is the blue line, and lean birds are the red line. Um, we've got probability of departure on the y-axis and stopover duration in days. Um, so not surprising. Um, it's the real purpose of stopover is to rest and refuel as quickly as possible. So it comes as no surprise that individuals that already have enough of a fuel reserve or have a larger fuel reserve, relative fuel reserves, should likely commence migration more quickly. This is sort of the result we're finding. Similarly, um, we looked at sort of, in this case, we're looking at the risk of departure or the hazard of departure. Um, in essence, this is how many times more likely a bird is to leave um, versus all other um, comparatively, um, versus tailwind component. And what we see is a strong linear relationship between increasing tailwind component and the, problem, and the risk of departure. Um, and on average, for every unit increase in tailwind component, um, we have about a 5% increase in the probability of departure. Um, again, negative tailwind components is basically a headwind of that magnitude. A positive tailwind component is a, obviously a tailwind component in that magnitude. Um, so again, a, a sort of a useful model, a sort of a useful result suggesting that, that, again, sort of corroborating the evidence we've seen in previous talks, that wind actually plays an important role, not even, not just in movements, but also on the decision to depart from a stopover site. Um, looking at the species-specific differences, again, we find a time-minimized migrant, uh, American Red Star in this case, is the black and yellow rump warbler is in the yellow. We find that the probability of departure for American red starts, they're about, on average, five times more likely to depart on a given night than the yellow rump warbler. Um, and this sort of lends itself to the nature, the life history, or the migratory strategy of this individual. Again, American red starts are sort of time-minimized migrants. 
And therefore, selection pressures are um, hastening the rate of migration for these individuals. So again, it's sort of a, another line of evidence indicating how life fish or migratory strategies play a role in governing behaviors during stopover. Now getting really at the, the whole point of this talk is the effect of the migratory barrier it's, itself on stopover duration and the probability of departure. Um, so once, account, once you account for all the other factors we just talked about, we find that actually we don't find any difference in the stopover duration or the probability of departure between these two sites. Um, although surprisingly, uh, surprisingly, we, there seems to be somewhat of a depart, uh, you know, the, the actual biggest departure occurs somewhere in the, meat, in the meat of migration where most birds are probably accumulating around six days on average. Um, this is an interesting result that we'll talk about in, in a sec, actually. Um, interest, this, is a, this is a difficult uh, graph to point out, but um, this is looking at the rankings, so fat, treating fat scores and rankings, and looking at the odds of arriving in fatter condition or better condition um, according to site. And the take home message is that we got prior pre-crossing of the migratory barrier. We see that birds are about three and a half times more likely to arrive in better condition prior to crossing than post-crossing. And this intuitively makes sense if you expect that birds who are crossing the lake are likely depleted, are more depleted in the fuel, fuel reserves than birds that just arrived um, prior to the barrier. So in summary, we found that, you know, I didn't show this as a figure, but what we found is that these, depart these effects, essentially, the effect of tailwind and the effect of fuel load on the departure decisions of these migratory pastorines actually didn't vary between species. There's no significant interaction between there. Um, and this kind of evidence points at a generalist type rule to decision making during migration. So that the, these birds aren't, these guys, these birds are essentially making um, choices um, very similar between each other, even though their migratory strategies differ. And the neat story comes when you start piecing together several lines of evidence. Um, we found no difference in stopover duration between sites. Um, but given the sort of the tight relationship between fuel load and the probability of departure, this comes as a surprise. How are these birds essentially, what are the two, poten there's two potential strategies these birds are doing to facilitate um, this occurrence? Um, and one of those is birds simply could, post-crossing, be increasing foraging intensity in that they're fueling much more quickly on the other side of the barrier in order to sort of compensate for any of the delays that condition had imposed. Alternatively, birds can simply be departing with lower fuel reserves. You expect without barriers in front of the bird's subsequent journey that post-crossing, these birds should depart um, with likely a, a lower threshold of fuel. Um, and this might be, this is likely the, the strategy we were potentially leaning towards, um, although these two are not mutually exclusive and actually, in fact, we could probably eliminate this or test this using metabolites on both sides of the barrier. So in conclusion, really context matters and landscape context is really important in terms of, although we haven't talked about it in this talk, um, given the tight linkages in habitat quality and sort of the rate of fuel deposition, and how, how birds can refuel efficiently, we expect that habitat quality and the subsequent dis decisions made around migratory barriers, such as around these Great Lakes regions, um, are likely to interact, such that low birds found themselves prior to crossing in low-quality habitats are likely to behave differently than birds found in high-quality habit habitats prior to crossing a barrier. Um, and again, this is sort of like all the studies so far, these, this is a, really a collaborative effort. Um, and this is just the start of it. We're starting to look at landscape, landscape and regional level movements using a, a large array of these towers located all throughout Ontario. And we'll be expanding north along the south shore of Lake Erie. Um, with, light, with that, I'd like to thank several folks, Ohio State University, Terrestrial Wildlife Ecology Lab, and all of my collaborators. And I'll take any questions. Mm-hmm.
Okay. So the first question was, what is the relative size of this crossing? Um, Lake Erie, um, on the pre-crossing site, the, different, the distance between the nearest shoreline is about 60 kilometers, not a large um, barrier. Um, and then the distance between Long Point and the subsequent, the closest landmass is about 90 kilometers. So relatively small, actually relatively small um, distance is covered. And your, third, your second question, sorry? Yes, so tailwind assistance, I don't have a slide here. We actually, for the most part, most, all our study, all our experimental groups um, utilized very similar wind conditions post-crossing as they did pre-crossing. Yeah, their utilization of, in terms of tailwind comp component used, yes, compared to what's available. Yes, Mike. Do you know how quickly you get to the extreme of the universe and Um, No, I mean, some studies have shown that I think birds can put on about half a gram to a gram or 10% of their body mass a day. Um, so we really don't know how. Well, I guess the question is so can they, can they go in the three days on the Um, I don't know. I'd have to look at that. I'd have to track. You know, it, it's just given the difficulties in tracking. You know, fat gain, <laughs> yeah. As many of us know, tracking mass changes throughout the stopover period, it's difficult. But you suspect 10% 10, 10 of your body mass a day, you're likely to put on a substantial amount of fat um, in three days. Enough to cross, enough at least to cross 90 kilometers. That's actually an interesting question. We've already started talking about this. Um, for the most part, we're finding that some of our red starts are actually, the ones we're catching, interestingly enough, are breeding fairly past this array. Basically, we're not detecting them in this array. Um, although, there might be issues with the gap in detectability. Um, so we can't rule that out. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's something we, gotta, we have to start considering. But now that we're able to track migrants, you know, at this type of scales to their breeding grounds, we might be able to address that question a little bit better. You know, is there a way to measure fat condition using some index from the blood? Yeah, I think some folks, I mean, someone can correct, well, a physiologist can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you can use metabolites to sort of, um, sort of tell how, how long, this, I think you can use metabolites to address how quickly they're depositing fuel. But again, I'm not a physiologist. All right, thanks a lot.